Bună ziua! We need to invest more money in giving drugs and needles to drug users to contain the spread of HIV. If this is surprising, then we should talk about mathematical models and how they can inform health policy. The global economic crisis has made countries around the world acutely aware of just how careful we must be managing scarce resources. Everyone from governments to charities to for-profits is scrambling to trim down spending and hoping to do so by removing wasteful programs rather than useful ones. Healthcare budgets have come under intense scrutiny because there's such a significant opportunity for improvement. For example, the US spent over 17% of its GDP on healthcare with questionable results. The spend is 2.5 times higher than that of the United Kingdom, but infant mortality is 1.5 times higher and life expectancy is two years shorter. Let's take this closer to home. How many of you think Romania's healthcare system is doing a great job? Raise your hand. I don't see anybody. <laughs> okay, how many of you think things could be done better? Raise your hand. Okay, pretty much everybody. Yeah, there's definitely room for improvement. And that's why I'm so excited today to talk to you about mathematical models. I, I spent the past six years studying applied mathematics and building models that can be useful to decision makers. Here's what I learned. Public health decision making is hard for many reasons. We will never have enough money to fund every public health intervention. And we must make difficult choices, not only between programs to address the same disease, but also between programs for different diseases. How aggressively should we recommend women get mammograms to screen for breast cancer? Should we fund a program that helps people quit smoking or one that finds and treats people with tuberculosis? How do we even begin to think about these trade-offs? The gold standard to evaluate intervention effectiveness are randomized clinical trials. That's the kind of trial where you take groups of people that are virtually identical, give them different interventions, or none at all, and then you check back after some period of time to see if the programs made a difference. But we could never do these for a whole population, and sometimes they're even unethical, like when they would involve withholding treatment from people who are sick. This is where mathematical models play a key role. They can provide objective estimates of program effectiveness, costs and benefits, when it's not straightforward or not intuitive to do so otherwise. They allow us to play with reality, see what would happen to the world with or without those programs. Models can be used to estimate the relative costs and benefits of interventions, and thus the results can inform decision makers. For the breast cancer screening question, the debate is still ongoing, but it turns out we may have been doing it wrong for years. The recommendation in the US, and I think in Romania as well, was for women over 40 to get a mammogram every year in the hope that that will catch cancers early. But the recommendation ignored the fact that mammograms are imperfect tests and they involve radiation. Breast cancer incidence in women between 40 and 50 is low and many of the lesions would never evolve into a cancer anyways. As a result, Millions of women were undergoing unnecessary procedures, painful biopsies, and personal anguish over false positives. With careful mathematical modeling, the researchers were able to show that for the current policy, the downsides outweighed the benefits. The recommendation is now changing to screen only women over 50 every two years. And this is a great example for how models have helped shape health policy. Of course, not everyone is open to using models to make decisions, since so they can appear as a cold and impersonal way. Models force us to think about complicated questions with heavy ethical aspects. To measure benefits, we use a measure called Quality Adjusted Life Years, or QALYs, which account not only for how long a person has lived, but also for how well they were able to live their lives. With qualities, we can answer the following question. 
Should we choose a treatment that extends life by 10 years, but with horrible side effects, or one that extended for only five years, but in perfect health? So if the quality of life for the 10 years is less than half the one you'd, got, you'd get with the other one, you should take the five years. These are tough questions to answer. And especially when you add cost into the mix, it gets even more complicated. What exactly what is the value we should attach to a year in a human life? Should we place more value on um, a year in a life of someone who's just starting? or in the year of life of someone who has precious few years left to live. There has been a study that looked at this, and based on how much we're willing to pay to put patients in treatment for kidney disease, the answer is about $130,000 per quality adjusted life year, ranging between 65,000 and 490,000, depending on the age of a patient. It does feel strange to attach such a hard value to a year in the life of a unique and irreplaceable human being. But the truth is, we make these decisions all the time. By choosing to fund one program over another, we attach an implicit value to these programs and the years of life they offer. In the absence of better tools, decision makers end up using um, things like historical patterns. We've always done it that way. Allocate, simple heuristics like allocating proportional to disease prevalence, personal experience, or political interests. And the decisions are often suboptimal. For example, if we keep allocating according to high prevalence, we may end up actually rewarding the programs that are doing a worse job at containing the disease. So we might as well, since we have to make these decisions, make them informed and use data and models. Different countries are at different stages of adopting the um, mathematical modeling in decision making. For example, the UK, the national healthcare system has set a threshold at about 30,000 pounds per quality, and they can choose not to pay for interventions that cost more than that. In the US, policy decisions must look only at clinical effectiveness, regardless of cost. One of the trade-offs where not taking cost into account makes it difficult is the one between treatment and prevention. It's easy to argue for treatment programs. You can show the people who got the medicines, the impact it had on their lives, and it's also easier to get political support if you can show that your program saved lives. It's harder to get support for prevention because when it works well, nothing happens. The trick is, Prevention is much cheaper. This trade-off is particularly important for controlling infectious diseases such as HIV, since they're transmitted from person to person. So one infection prevented now may avert many other infections in the future. HIV is now a manageable, treatable disease due to medical advances over the past few decades. But there is still no cure, and over 33 million people are currently infected. Every minute, five new infections and over three deaths occur. We're falling short on prevention. For every person who started treatment, two new infections occurred. But we're also falling short on treatment, since about 60% of the people in need are not receiving the life-saving medications. What's more, treatment for HIV also works incredibly well as prevention because it reduces the viral concentration in the blood of the person, thus making them less infectious, and that's about by 96%. Mathematical models are ideal for shedding light on this complexity. So, I've been collaborating with the United Nations AIDS program to develop a practical model that decision makers around the world can use to allocate scarce HIV resources. The model is designed to be customizable with local data, and this flexibility is essential because the epidemic is so different around the world. For example, in Africa, most new infections are, are caused by unprotected sex, whereas in Eastern Europe, the key epidemic driver is injection drug use. <clears throat> the model has helped us understand some key insights into health policy decision-making. The first one 
is that there is no one-size-fits-all solution. And just because something worked in a country, you can't just transfer it to another, even for fairly similar epidemics. For example, the optimal solution for Ukraine, which is the country with the highest HIV prevalence in Europe, is different from the one in St. Petersburg, Russia, which is a city with high prevalence, and the epidemics are believed to be fairly similar. The model also helped us quantify the trade-offs we make when we choose to think short-term versus long-term, since people with HIV live fairly long lives. If we myopically optimize by looking at the next year or two, we may lose the costs and the benefits of programs that work over a long period of time. Finally, going back to our discussion about qualities, the objective we choose when we allocate resources makes a difference to what we'll do. For example, infections averted is a metric that's widely, widely used in, in HIV control as opposed to qualities. But if we only think of infections averted, it means we're implicitly placing a minimal value on the extra years of life that treatment offers. Finally, I think the most interesting way that models can contribute to policy is to act as objective support for programs that would otherwise be undesirable or politically unfeasible. <clears throat> And this is particularly important for HIV control in Eastern Europe. Um, remember how I started by saying we should invest more money in drug users? Let's go back to that a little bit. Eastern Europe, uh, Eastern Europe has an HIV driven, uh, sorry, an addiction drug user driven epidemic. Um, and programs to address that um, part of um, HIV are usually undesirable because there's a lot of stigma and uh, marginalization associated with drug use. These programs can be things like needle exchange, where you give drug users clean needles to avoid sharing, which is how injection drug users get infected. Or they can be things like methadone substitution therapy, where you give them an approved opiate in a controlled setting to avoid, again, equipment sharing and overdoses. One striking example of modeling making a difference is the needle exchange program in New Haven, Connecticut, that's in the United States, <clears throat> in the early 90s. There was a huge debate about the usefulness of such a program in the first place, and people were saying it might even encourage drug use. Researchers went and collected needles and measured the prevalence of HIV in them before and after a needle exchange program was implemented. With careful analysis, they were able to show that the program reduced HIV incidence by 30% without increasing drug use. After the study was published, the impact was huge. Over 200 needle exchange programs are currently operating in the US. The other piece that models can bring up is to uncover hidden benefits of such undesirable programs. I studied the role of methadone substitution therapy in controlling the HIV epidemic in the Ukraine at a time when its large-scale adoption was under um, a huge debate. I showed that methadone is a cheap and effective way of containing HIV in Ukraine, and what's more, the benefits of the program would be accumulated not only in the drug user population, but also in the general population. And more than half, than half those benefits will go to the general population because drug users have sex with the general population, and that's how HIV gets spread. So overall, society would be better off spending scarce HIV funds on programs for drug users. I'll leave you with that conclusion and hope I've given you even more reason to believe that it's cool to work with models all day. Thank you. <clears throat>